to talk to you a little bit about indirect life loss. I know we've had a handful of questions about indirect life loss this week. Um, for those of you that were at the consequence training, the first little bit of this is going to be uh, just review. And then I'm going to get into how the method we have, how you use LifeSim in conjunction with the method we have to come up with an estimate for indirect life loss. Right? Um, and our application is generally kind of a screening level application now where we if when we're looking at indirect life loss we have kind of a screening check at the production level and then if that screening check says yeah this could be an issue then we'll go forward and spend a little more time on it all right discuss the current guidance uh it's sitting with the rmc right now i is it i don't know if jason's kicked it up for tech review yet or not i don't think he has review the method that we've developed for indirect life loss, use LifeSim to support indirect life loss estimates. So really gonna try to spend most of our time for focusing on this last bullet, right? All right, so the week before COVID, the week before COVID, Jason Woody, Nick, and Ricky Oski and I locked ourselves in a room, said we need to come up with a way to account for secondary mortality. It's coming up a lot, people are asking us about it. And then by the way, there's a whole bunch of empirical evidence that says this matters quite a bit, right? That Saturday is when the first stay at home order in California took place. The next day, that was when, uh, I think Yolo County was Saturday. Direct life loss, right? Why? A lot of ICU beds got filled up, right? COVID's not the only way that you can have some sort of medically related fatality. And so if you're a stage four cancer patient and you need to get treatment and there's no room for you and you lose your life, that's secondary mortality caused effectively secondary from COVID. And that the National Academy of Sciences has gotten into doing some, some cool stuff related to that, cool stuff related to that, but helping track that type of information. The other thing the National Academy of Sciences is doing is working with trying to come up with a standard for how deaths are recorded due to disasters because if someone loses their life from a heart attack but that heart attack was brought on by um a extraordinary situation like you need to evacuate the dam just breached you're going to lose your home and that brings on a heart attack and they record it as a heart attack there's no way to link it back to the disaster right so there's some there's some stuff going on related to all this outside of the corps of engineers all right direct flood fatality that's what we're doing in life sim right this is your final shelter location is exposed to flooding and the presence of water leads to you losing your life your interaction with water leads to you losing your life somehow whether it's structure collapsing on top of you, drowning, um, physical trauma from debris flow, vehicle or person out in the open. I will call it electrocution. Electrocution is one, one that can be both direct and indirect. Um, if you're walking through shallow floodwaters and there's a, down power, a live down power line, sends a charge that we would call that direct because the presence of water in a place that it's not supposed to be led to the conditions that you lose in your life. Indirect life loss could be electrocution, could be a power surge when the power comes back on after prolonged power outage or something like that. So you could flick a light in your house and there could be a surge because of the power problem related caused by the disaster. And although you haven't actually interacted with water at all, the presence of the disasters impacted the utility grid in such a way that it sent a surge and you lost your life that way. So this is direct, indirect. So with direct, right, we're thinking about, we're applying life sim with flooding, right? And we're thinking about, okay, flood happens at such and such a time, sample, we're redistributing population at risk, figuring out where people might end up over several, you know, probably thousands of iterations and trying to come up with an estimate. It's for the duration of that flood event, right? The indirect fatality can happen before, during, or after the event. So your timeline is quite a bit more extended. And that 
temporal component really adds a great deal more uncertainty because the further out you get from a disaster, the harder it is to link mortality to the disaster itself, right? Common mortalities, medical conditions, heart attacks, primarily, if you take, if you take anything away about indirect life loss, I would say the primary causes of disaster-related secondary mortality from what we found are some sort of cardiac condition or cardiac distress, and then something related to a power problem, right? So power problem can have a whole bunch, cause a whole bunch of other problems. You lose power, you're 80 years old, you walk down the hall, you trip, you break your hip, nobody, you can't get to a phone, you can't contact anybody, you're there without food and water for days, something like that. So, or Sandy, people trying to run generators inside of apartments and carbon monoxide poisoning, things like that. So power problem, particularly during extreme weather, cold or hot, right? Power problem can also mean that you're exposed to extreme weather conditions for a prolonged period of time. So that's the type of thing we're talking about when we're talking about indirect life loss. So I talked about before, during, and after, and how far out are we really going to go? So with direct, it's during the flood, drowning, collapse of the structure, indirect, some kind of accident or medical related fatality that could be indirect during the event. Then for a sh short period after, and when we say short term, I would, I would say first three months af after a disaster. That's really the period we're thinking of, of is, about, is about 90 days. Yeah, question, Kevin. Good question. So, I'm gonna. This is, I'm gonna say it could be. You could have an. You could have interact with water, get an infection like sepsis in your blood, and lose your life. And we might call that direct. Um, if you interacted with water and you got some sort of bacteria in your system and a couple months later something else happened and you couldn't treat it or whatever like that it gets harder to link it back to that so it, it can kind of be both yeah yeah generally because from an evaluation standpoint that infection component's not something that we could really easily account for in life sim so it made sense for us to put it here um, but if you if you got into the definitions and you're looking at it, you're like, well, technically, if you interact with water, got an infection, died, wouldn't that be direct? By by the letter of the law, it could be, right? Do you have anything to add? Maybe just that if it's a lot less clear, like if you're water, maybe you're not direct. You could have a city product that's up there that's more than you hear. Right. Yep. Yep. Good question, though. All right. Direct drowning, collapse of the structure, accident medical and indirect, then exposure, medical stress. Um, stress could fit in here as well under flood. So that either flood during or short term after. Then getting into longer term, this gets beyond, I would say, what we're trying to do in our method. Um, some of these things could happen certainly in the short term after, but you get into famine, political unrest. Um, you know, think of think of a dam failing in a war torn country in the you know, like Iraq or something like that. You know, that's what we mean when we say political unrest. If a dam failed there, and then that led to unrest and maybe fighting. A lot of people lose their lives from fighting that might not have otherwise had that dam not failed, right? Um, these aren't generally included in our mortality rates in this method. How many are familiar with Bankiao? Dam failure, Taylor? Ish, okay, kind of. <laughs> All right, 
Okay. Bankiao is the highest, from what we know, Bankiao has caused the most life loss from a dam failure in history of the events that we've tracked. 26,000 direct. We've, I tell you, we've been doing this for a while. We, we don't see numbers like that. We see high numbers in, 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 we see numbers in the thousands. We don't see numbers like that. This is observed, right? This is the best estimate observed, 26,000. But then for long periods after flood was up, people didn't have access to food. There were food drops. People were eating food that was contaminated by the water, getting some sort of foodborne illness and dying, led to 200,000 additional deaths. So almost 230,000 people lost their lives from the failure of Bankyao Dam. It's hard to, hard to comprehend. All right, bluff. It's weird to have the bluff a few, few slides in, but why does this matter so much? Well, these guys from National Weather Service and NOAA, Rappaport and Blanchard got together and did a review of 59 tropical cyclones from period from 1959 to 2012 and said, how many of these deaths are direct? How many of these, directs are in, these deaths are indirect? And they found that about 45% of the deaths, aggregate deaths from all those hurricanes combined were from indirect causes. So before we got into all this, we said, what if we just took our life loss estimates from life and multiplied by two? We didn't think that would, that would hold up. So decided to do a little more, but finding was this is pretty important, particularly in cases of hurricanes, right? Because hurricanes, wind damage, you can have really large areas without power, um, lose access to critical facilities and things that people need to survive. So hurricanes in particular, like your Katrina's, have had really significantly high indirect life loss. All right, indirect life loss, I said this already, most often with electricity, some sort of power problem, cardiovascular failure, evacuation of vehicle accidents. I'm gonna get into evacuation a little bit because you're gonna say, Jesse, on Monday or Tuesday, when you're talking about warning and PAI, you said that accidents during mass evacuation aren't really a thing. So vehicle accidents, when I say vehicle accidents, I actually mean post-event, there's some sort of change condition to your transportation infrastructure, down tree, something like that, lights not working the way it's supposed to, those type of accidents. So not, not so much during evacuation. Evacuation, I'll get into that a little bit. That's more related to being exposed to extreme weather and being on roads for a really long time. So these are the top 10. This is a table from Rappaport and Blanchard's report, 2016, you can see, Top 10, about, about 100 more people indirect life loss than direct life loss for those top 10 hurricanes. So top 10 being the ones with the highest amount of indirect life loss. See Katrina up here. So based on their estimate, Katrina has a little more than 50% indirect life loss. It's pretty wild, right? People trapped in attics, things like that, extreme heat. but indirect causes than all the others. And then down here we have this, and this is where you see in the aggregate, indirect life loss makes up about 45%. All right, so let's come up with a method. We're gonna have, we said, how do we account for evacuees and non-evacuees, people who don't evacuate, we gotta, is there a way to combine them and have single fatality rates like we do in LifeSim? No, probably not. So we're gonna have these two different ones. I'm gonna say, we're gonna have an evacuees group and a non-evacuees group. Fortunately. LifeSim does this really cool thing with how it simulates evacuation, so it's not so hard to come up with those numbers, and I'll get into that a little bit. And these are the mortality rates. You can see some repeats over here. It's not a lot of data, and that made this really challenging. It's challenging to get a good fatality rate point for direct life loss. It is orders of magnitude harder to come up with mortality rates, indirect secondary mortality rates, because the, instead of saying, we know that about this many people were here when the flood started and about evacuation looked like this. So we don't know exactly where people were when they were exposed, but it was about like this doing that sort of exercise. We're saying how many people were without power in New York and New Jersey during Sandy and for how long? And how many of those people were actually directly impacted by 
the hurricane and the snowfall, how many people were kind of out of the areas of surge and coastal flooding that lost power in an ancillary way and maybe lost their lives that way. It's really hard to come up with the number, the group that was ex impacted by a disaster. So it's a lot harder to come up with this impact idea of impacted population at risk than it is to ha come up with an estimate of population at risk, right? We've got the NSI, Nick and his team have done a lot of really great work to put that together. So we, we do fairly well on that front. A lot harder to come up with some of these numbers to get, to get here. All right, I'm gonna try to get through this quickly. This is, a, this is a busy slide, but we're breaking these out into causes and then factors related to each one of these indirect life loss causes, right? So for those of you that saw this, um, in New Orleans a month ago, this is going to be repeat, but after this, we're going to get into how you use outputs from LifeSim to go through our method, right? Heart related, heart attacks during Teton Dam failure, 10 documented cases of cardiac arrest during various Atlantic hurricanes, nothing reported during the Orville Dam incident and that evacuation. So health related, how we primary influence factors, we're saying Age of the person, there's some correlation with heart disease and how old you are. Anyone's health, of course, you can be younger, and if you're in poor health, you could have heart, potential heart health issues. And then intensity, where if it's a super stressful sort of situation, it could induce cardiac arrest, right? All right, exposure. What do we mean by that? Because we've been talking about exposed PAR all week. So when we're saying exposure, we're saying how long are you interacting or existing within those post-disaster, those suboptimal post-disaster conditions, whatever they might be, right? So extreme weather, hyperthermia or hypothermia, um, 57 deaths attributed to pre-existing health conditions and extreme heat. So you, if you have this, then you have extreme weather and you're exposed to that for a long time, those, those things can compound. And that's what we found doing this is, how these different things play on one another, a lot of them are, are dependent, where if there's extreme heat and you're exposed to that extreme heat, extreme heat for a long period of time, your likelihood of losing your life begin, begins to increase once you get beyond probably eight to 12 hours of being exposed to extreme heat. All right, so again, you're gonna see age and health a lot in here, temperature and duration. So how long are you exposed to these suboptimal conditions? Accidents. Accidentally shot himself, ran into his truck with a whole bunch of stuff in his hand, discharged his firearm. Um, 23 people died in a bus fire during Hurricane Rita. This one's not, it's pretty awful. Um, it was a nursing home facility. All of these people were immobile, so they needed someone to get them in a wheelchair, take them places, and the bus caught on fire, and there was no way to get them out. No life lost during accidents from the Orville evacuations. So about 200,000 people hopping on roads all at once, and there's no um, death associated with accidents from that Orville evacuation. Traffic congestion, distance to shelter, and intensity, right? So traffic congestion can cause accidents, but really what traffic congestion does is it increases the duration that you're exposed to perhaps suboptimal conditions. So if you're in the car for a long period of time and you get tired, you might get into a car accident because you all know that when you're really sleepy, you probably shouldn't drive, right? Hopefully you know that. All right. Now, health related with the non-evacuees group. So what does that look like? Uh, talked about five days of memorial while we were in New Orleans. For those of you that are familiar with, there's a, I believe there was a, it's a Netflix that came out with something, but there's a book called Five Days of Memorial. And this is the reverse triage sort of thing where a doctor went around and said, we're going to evacuate these people because we might be able to see, see, save them. And these people, I don't think they're going to make it. And it's been a lot of fallout from that, right? Because it's, should you have that power to say when someone can and can't live? And her response has been, basically, this was a terrible situation to be put in. And I did the best I could to save as many lives as possible. And those that couldn't be saved, I didn't want to take resources from those that might be able to be saved. And some people can accept that and some people can't, right? Um, certainly not a position I'd want to be in. 
So health-related non-evacuees group exposure, multiple deaths from people trapped in attics during Katrina, right? Carbon monoxide poisoning, hyperthermia cases for, um, that should be hypothermia caused for multiple deaths in Sandy aftermath because happened during the winter, snowfall, extreme cold, loss of power, people didn't have generators, couldn't have heat, right? Age, health, temperature, power. So duration, isolationism. So I'll get into isolationism a little bit when we get into the method. A lot of deaths by electrocution, um, vehicles striking down trees, falls in dark passages. So, you know, accidents can mean a lot of different things. You're saying, oh, wait a minute, vehicle deaths, that should be over here in evacuees. But we're saying people who chose not to evacuate drove around after the evacuation was ordered in the area that had been impacted by the disaster and gotten car accidents and lost their lives that way. So condition of transportation infrastructure, whether or not there's power, and again, duration. You see duration woven through here quite a bit. Anybody have any questions? That's a busy slide. No? Oh, okay. Impacted population. Impacted population, or IPAR, is the group of people affected by the suboptimal conditions created by disaster before, during, or after, right? So how do we get that number? All right, for the non-evacuees group, we're saying population at risk, less the number of people who evacuate, because we don't want a couple double count, plus the people with no power. Everyone looks at me when we, looks at us when we say, say, how on earth do you come up with this number? It's not easily. Um, less direct life loss, right? Because we don't want to kill the same person twice in our simulation. That wouldn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, IPAR evac, it's, it's much easier to come up with. It's just the number of people who evacuate, less life loss on roads. Where do you go in life sim? Well, you can view the average, the summary average results by table, par, par over 65 plus par under 65. And that's going to give you, this is going to be calculating non-evacuees, right? So we're going to get that information about population at risk. Then we're going to use some information about the power grid. We generally use uh, the high fields data, which is critical infrastructure data kept by the by DHS to look at it at the power grid and try to figure out, okay, what key components of this utilities infrastructure is going to be hit by this dam failure and how many people might be impacted by that. And it is a guess, right? There's quite a bit of uncertainty with this. What we normally do is we'll try to come up with a range and we'll go through the method to come up with a few different answers, a couple different answers based on uncertainty around these different parameters. So that we're not saying indirect life loss is 100. We're move evacuees, right? And then subtract direct life loss. So all of this stuff is available in the summary average results table in LifeSim. So when you were going through and reviewing all those results in the workshop, you can get all that information right from LifeSim. And most of what you're doing in here, with the exception of people no power, is you can pull this information from LifeSim. So you're going through, you're doing the LifeSim work. Um, we don't calculate indirect life loss in LifeSim, but a lot of the information that you're giving LifeSim is going to help you go through this exercise. Yep. So total population would be you have a structured data set and the NSI has distributed population in each one of those structures. So that's going to be our total day and night population within our particular study area. Population at risk is defined by the inundation extent for any given flood. So we're saying anyone who starts within that flood extent is counted in the population at risk for both day and night. And then exposed is all those that are still there when the flood arrives, right? Um, that answer your question? Yes. Cool. All right. Shadow evacuation is added to the total. Um, anyone familiar with this concept of shadow evacuation? So it's the idea that you might not be in the area that's been in the geographic boundary of the area that's been ordered to evacuate, but you're seeing people evacuate you know they could be your neighbors they could be the street over something like that and because you're close in proximity to the area that's been ordered to evacuate you choose to evacuate so shadow evacuation or volunteer evacuation from the area that's in the shadow of the area that was
direct life loss as well, right? We don't say only everyone in this inundation extent should be allowed to evacuate in our direct life loss simulation. We're saying it's possible that people outside of this area might also choose to evacuate. We're going to try to account for that. So we might put people on roads that would increase the likelihood of traffic congestion to try to account for this sort of situation. All right, evacuees. This is a little easier, right? Get the number of people mobilized, less the direct life loss on roads. Um, go to iteration results, par mobilized, right click on the attribute heading, select summary statistics, and you'll get, a, you'll get an estimate, right? So you'll get a, and then life loss on roads is gonna be life loss caught, and you're just gonna take that median result out of life center. All right, and hopefully you guys remember this from course a month ago this is how we break this down for evacuees cardio deaths per a thousand people that's health and age percent of medical facilities or nursing facilities that will need to evacuate if you have one in your study area but it's outside of your inundation extent they might not need to evacuate right so be thoughtful about that combination of warning and potential damage. So intensity factor, think of it this way. If it's, if you don't take action now, you're going to lose your home and you and your family might lose your lives. You have a minute to act. High intensity factor. If it's, there's a hurricane coming this way, think it'll be here in five days. Be aware, be prepared to evacuate. Right now, this is just a notice. You've got time that the urgency is not going to be there, right? So the intensity component of that is, is much lower. So intensity is going to be lower for protracted events. It's going to be higher for rapid onset events like a dam breach. Extreme temperature, right? Extreme heat or below freezing. How much time will be spent in a vehicle? We put all this stuff together. Um, sorry. Then methodology for non evacuees, similar stuff, but. This is where we get into the power problem, exposure, flood duration, response capability, and isolationism. These are similar. Response capability is how able are neighboring communities at a regional, local, state level of responding to help you think Joso, Tokyo, being able to get up to Joso to support with rescue. Isolationism is, are you on an island, Hurricane Maria? Are you cut off from other places such that you will be solely impacted by this and there's almost no way to get to you, right? So response capability is, are there people nearby that also have the resources to help you? So we're looking outside of our area to groups that could be helpful. And isolationism is not so much about proximity, um, it's about if you're cut off or not, right? So it could be that there's people that could help you, but you're totally cut off, so they can't get to you, that sort of thing. So that's why those are separate, even though they seem like similar things. So you're using the same health and age, extreme temperature from evacuees group, expectation for power problem and a duration. So we're trying to figure out how long might power be out for. Duration of time, people will be unable to leave home to get to a hospital or other stuff that they might need. Ability of surrounding communities, emergency responders to address based on scale of the disaster and ability of external communities, responders to exist. So the way we've got those defined is blurs the lines a little bit, but what we're saying, based on the scale, the disaster's really big. It might limit the ability of those neighboring communities to help. And this is more about being isolated, right? Okay. So then we go through and we apply these factors and they're linked to, most of them are linked, low, medium, low, moderate, high will be one through five, or um, intensity is the only one that gets this really high score, and it's really subjective range. So this is a situation with intensity where if you think it's going to be really high, we encourage you to use a range and go through this method a few different times to see how much it matters. It could be that this doesn't make a huge difference. See 100 for campfire, that's our, that's our max and the reason being is this is a, a wildfire. Wildfire is bearing down on your house. 
you have moments to leave or you're going to lose your life and you know that you're going to lose all your worldly possessions because there's no way to evacuate a house from a fire. Okay, calculate the total score, come up with these par points, and then we have what are called fatality points. So we've got impacted par over here, then we take those I par points, we multiply them by intensity plus temperature time duration. Remember I said some of these are dependent, some of them are independent. So where it's multiplicative, we're trying to say that if, if this and this, they compound one another, so we're going to multiply them. Intensity, we're saying that's separate, so we're going to add it to temperature and duration. So that's the computation. Again, signing points. A lot of this, again, is review from, from the consequences course. Now I'm going to take you through an example um, on one of our dams, uh, risk assessment on one of our dams. So where do we get factors, the health and age stuff? We go to CDC. They keep a map at the census block level of all those with different health-related concerns. And that's where we pull all Looking at a dam in Vermont. So looking at our existing data and we're saying, okay, where do you plot relative to our existing data? Knowing that, all right, one's down here where it's low health factors and then Katrina's way up here is higher, worse health factors. And we're going to say, all right, we're going to look at this county in Vermont and say, what does that look like? Um, and we see that it's 201 right here, right? So that puts us right in, right between, right in the Maria Sandy area. So that's how we're going to, and we're going to take that number and we're going to stick it in the middle of all these other ones so that we can sample along that curve that we're creating, right? Extreme temperature. There's a lot of different information out there. Um, but you can get mean daily averages and swings on temperature. So up here, we know that it's, it's possible for it to get really cool. Um, average annual extreme minimum temperature. This is actually uh, plant hardiness zones, which is interesting. This is generally a tool for the ag industry. So plant hardiness zones is kind of interesting because it'll tell you, give you an understanding of what sorts of um, ag, you know, what types of things could survive being grown in Vermont based on that average annual extreme minimum temperature, right? So we know that it's quite low, so we're gonna say, all right, we're, we're looking at extreme cold. Based on the, our observed data, the empirical data, we found that extreme heat is more likely to lead to indirect mortality than extreme cold. So that's why you're seeing hot three and cold two. So this is gonna be a two, right? Similar area of the world to Sandy. We know that it gets really cold in Vermont during the winter not likely to experience extreme heat. So we're gonna go with two. Remember I said high field electric, electrical grid. So they have a cool web app, Esri web app, and you can see a pretty, it's, it's fairly high level, but you can see kind of generally a grid of all the utility lines in the United States. So zoom in on that, this is North Springfield Dam. All right, we've got power lines going across here. Maybe those get toppled. We've got them feeding down in from this main line here, but then you can see this main line going out here as well. Yeah, these ones down here will get knocked out. Probably people in Springfield proper are gonna lose power, but because we've still got this main line that's out of the impact zone, that number of people without power is, is gonna be smaller than it might be in other places. And we think that that duration is gonna be fairly short. Based on, their ability, based on the duration of the flood. It's not gonna be up for very long. Think that they can get power back pretty quickly because we're not hitting any major substations or anything like that. All right, duration. So fortunately, particularly if you've got a RAS model, you can go and click on any grid cell and LifeSim will show you a hydrograph because it calls the RAS API, right? So you know that water gets over bank at about is about 10 feet, right? But over banks, probably not enough to measure duration. So we're going to say, when we say duration, we're going to say when there's a few feet of flooding. So we're going to, we picked five feet of flooding for this particular one. So we say, how long is water going to be about five feet above the embankment? And we said, all right, from about a day and a half, almost, wait, sorry, let me see that. About two days, excuse me. So about two days, give or take. Um, so 49 hours over bank, 
And again, we went a little above overbank, so we could say people are actually flooded for a period of about two days. Um, and we're saying that's, that's not terribly long, you know, where Katrina water was up for weeks, right? We're saying this is, this is relatively short. So this ended up being a two. Um, response capability. I grew up in New Hampshire. Uh, the consequences guy, professional that was working on this, said that as part of the elicitation, emergency manager said it would be really difficult to get other people in here to help us. And he had a lot of reasons for that. And I was like, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me because you're, you're right here. Hampshire Upper Valley's here. There's tens of thousands of people there. A lot of, there's a big hospital there. It's only about an hour away. Um, up this way a little further in Vermont. Um, we're not too far away from Rutland. There's a ability to respond within an hour, two hours. And I thought that the response capability factor was pretty minor here, but the emergency manager said otherwise. So we used their information. This is all the stuff. These are the notes from that right here. So rating of two was assigned, right? Isolationism, not a factor here, right? We're not concerned about rural Vermont being cut off from the rest of the world so much. You can make jokes about how rural Vermont is or how it might be isolated because of all the cows they used to have, but um, my mom's from Vermont. We gave her a hard time growing up, uh, but not much of a factor here, right? So we're going to say that's pretty low. Critical health factors, would any, would any of these medical facilities need to evacuate? And if required, would they? So we want to get an understanding of would they actually evacuate if they needed to? Do they have the ability to do that? So that's the question we're trying to answer with critical health facility evacuation. Only critical health facility was outside of our max inundation extent. And it's hard to tell from an aerial imagery, but the topography is such that you're coming up a pretty steep hill right here. So they're well elevated outside of the inundation area. So we said not much of a factor here. Intensity. This is what wildfires are kind of apocalyptic, but lens of warning time combined with potential damage. How frantic do you think population at risk would be? Is your event well forecasted so park can prepare, or is it sudden and destructive? Rank your projects. This is, this is a subjective factor, um, and because the range is so large, it doesn't fit as nicely as some of the other ones do. It's not as easy, so you got to be careful with this one. And like I said, we encourage, if you're going, getting into one of these assessments, we encourage you to use a range and then probably do like a min, a max, and a most likely sort of thing with the intensity factor. All right. In fact, I have a few hours of warning time, but proximity to the dam of the par will likely cause moderate frantic activity. No, majority of par not aware that the dam exists. No, most people are aware of North Springfield Dam. Local emergency managers do not have a program in place to increase awareness. They, it's not true. They do. Um, there is an ungated spillway. Rival time of flood is less than an hour and a half. No. Um, at our primary population center, which is Springfield, Vermont, right? Once it gets down to the Vermont, New Hampshire border, you get into the Connecticut River and you pick up main stem Connecticut's a much larger river. So <clears throat> pick up a lot of storage, flood looks different. So we're really looking at Springfield, Vermont for indirect life loss here. Um, most likely was 30 and consequence guy said, we're going to say worst case is 40. So we used that kind of range to try to figure out how much it matters. Didn't matter a whole lot with a, with a fairly narrow range like that. Evacuation duration, you know, consider, you see contraflow here. Um, this is Houston, this is Rita, right? So we know that Rita evacuation was pretty bad. Three weeks after Hurricane Katrina, one of the highest observed evacuation rates I've seen doing this work is about 95%. But three weeks after Katrina, you can understand why people wanted to get out of Dodge. But people being stuck on highways and exposed to extreme heat and that leading to people's deaths contributed to making the decision not to evacuate for Hurricane Harvey, right? And you could argue that maybe that wasn't the best decision ultimately. Um, but the storm stalled out over the city for much longer than they forecasted, right? So Harvey ended up being quite a bit more destructive from a life loss consequences point. Getting back to indirect life loss, use LifeSim to determine evacuation time and congestion. 
So you have those nice evacuation outflow charts. You can see how long it takes for, about how long it takes for people to reach safety. And that'll help you understand about how long people are gonna be on the roads for. If it's a few hours, it's not that big of a deal. If we're up eight hours, we're saying that's gonna increase the likelihood that you lose your life indirectly from evacuating a little bit. And then when you get in that over 12 hour range, that's when research tells us that that likelihood increases um, quite a bit. All right, duration, not really a thing here. Rural, you know, Springfield, Vermont might be a larger type city. Um, in Vermont, it's, it's not, by the way, it's not a very big place, but there's really no concern for traffic congestion, right? Or long evacuation duration because of the topography is such that you can go up a hill about a half mile and you're, you're safe. So not so concerned that people are gonna be spending 10 hours trying to get up to a hotel in Burlington or something like that. Again, you can pull this information right from LifeSim, the evacuation outflow. 